following is a presentation of Learfield IMG College. From the Georgia Southern Sports Network, powered by Learfield IMG College. Wings up, Eagle Nation! Touchdown, Georgia Southern! This is Inside Eagle Nation, your all-access look into Eagle Athletics. Take a look through all the other action in Georgia Southern Athletics this past week. A lot of road action. A lot of teams hitting the old I-16 out of town. Getting on the steel horse and taking us to parts north, south, west, wherever. Can't really go too much farther east. Now let's return to the Learfield IMG College studios. Here are your hosts, Colin Lacey and Danny Reed. That's a fact, Jack. Welcome into another edition of Inside Eagle Nation, episode number 172, coming at you on a Monday afternoon, Monday evening now, I should say, here from Hanner Fieldhouse, but a lot to get to on this week's edition. Danny, fresh back from his trip down to Pensacola for the Sunbelt Conference Tournament, got to see a lot of our friends, got to see a good game of basketball on the opening round for Georgia Southern. We'll dive into all of that as we get going, but your favorite memory from Pensacola, and I heard it wasn't as legendary as last year down in Pensacola with Josh <laughs> Sowers, but I'm sure it did not disappoint. We were able to get a, a lot of the guys together. It wasn't as big of a group as last year. The schedules were different, and some teams that had gotten buys weren't coming into town until a day or so later, but had a chance to meet up with a couple of the executives from Learfield that were in town. We had a chance to meet I up with I saw John them. Cole, our vice yep. president, was in town. Yeah, he was in town. We had a chance to visit with him for a while. A couple of guys at ULM, very appreciative that they – were able to show us a very nice time that that night and then the the fact that the the lodging for georgia southern was a lot different this year a year ago <laughs> let's just say this was significantly better and when we speak of tournaments whatever the sport is it's just as much of an experience as it is what happens on the court or on the field and experience wise i think this is something that despite even though them not being there anymore it's it's still something that they're going to be able to remember the beaches at Pensacola were absolutely beautiful. I think those guys had enough time to enjoy that while still pulling off an upset in round one against Coastal Carolina before eventually falling to App. But to to end the season at that destination, I think the league did a really good job. This is the first time we had a chance to see the Bay Center. Didn't see it last year because both of our teams played at Pensacola Junior College. Yeah, we didn't even see it on the screen. Yeah, but very good setup. You could definitely tell it was a hockey-style arena. Wasn't there something in, I think it was the app game, that the court was getting too much moisture on it, and I saw the Sunbelt officials starting to, not officials officials, not referees, but the Sunbelt office thankfully, starting to have conversations. Well, thankfully, they kept the Zamboni back in the tunnel. We didn't, we didn't quite need <laughs> well, maybe that. Maybe you needed that to clear it. If anybody was going to bring the Zamboni with them, it should have been app. True. Or Jay. He could just bring it from the Cajun Dome. They used to have the minor league hockey team there. The ice skaters. I could see Jay driving a Zamboni. I can't. <laughs> okay. I can't see that. We dive into everything Georgia Southern Athletics as we check in on the news and notes. Georgia Southern men's golf currently in the middle of the Colleton River Collegiate today and tomorrow through one day of action, or almost through one day. Georgia Southern leading the tournament at 1500 par, number 26, South Florida in the two spot behind Georgia Southern, but the Eagles ahead by seven strokes. South Florida eight under for the day, but that one just about set to get through. They are on the 14th through the 16th hole, both Georgia Southern and South Florida, but Georgia Southern with a pretty good lead, seven strokes going into the back half of the day. We'll check on that again a little bit later on in this week's edition of Inside Eagle Nation. But Wilson Andrus leads the way for Georgia Southern. He is tied for fourth at three under. He, along with Brantley Baker for Georgia Southern, tied for fourth to lead the way for the Eagles. When you said somewhere between 14 through 16, it made me think of the Masters because the former streaming coverage was, <laughs> well, you can watch Amen Corner right. somewhere between 14 and 16. I know we're going to North Augusta tomorrow, but when you said that, that made me think about how the streaming used to be before ESPN took over the first two rounds. That's right. I forgot about that. You had like the four different options. Yeah. yeah. And as the day went longer, one through three would just be blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> but Georgia Southern men's golf, hoping to finish strong. Again, they will finish that up tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow morning, 
and afternoon. And then they'll have about a week and a half before hosting the Schenkel Invitational Friday the 18th through Sunday the 20th over at the Georgia Southern Golf Course. i got to give a quick shout to SID Mark Janak because this is the time of the year where it's tournament time for men's basketball. He's dealing with men's golf and their other showcases, but how much work goes into the Schenkel and something that we've spoken about before on this podcast, how important it is to people in this area and the amount of talent and the teams that it attracts to come down here every year. And I always tell Mark about this as a, you're either just starting the Schenkel or you're finishing the Schenkel <laughs> because there's got to be at least a month, six weeks straight where yeah. once men's basketball stuff is taken care of for that day or that weekend, He's hopping right on Shankle because there's just that much to do, and they do such a good job with that. Yeah, and if you haven't been able to get out and experience the Shankle Invitational, that's a lot of fun to be out at the golf course surrounded by a lot of really good people over there for the Forest Heights Country Club. But Georgia Southern Women's Golf currently also in the middle of a tournament. They finished day one today of the North Florida Collegiate down at the Jacksonville Golf and Country Club. Taking a look at the golf stat they're about to finish up. They are somewhere between 15 through 18 on the course. And Georgia Southern sitting 10th, so right around the middle of the pack for Georgia Southern at 21 over. The leader is the host tournament in North Florida. They are even. Everybody else over par, but Georgia Southern 21 over. They are 7 over for the second round of the day. And a lot of people don't realize how a golf tournament in the collegiate side works. The first day... Well, normally you get in a day early, have a practice round, and then the next day, I believe it's you play 72 holes. So you play a lot of golf. Then the last day on round two, you play anywhere between 18 to 36 holes. And there's so many teams that participate. You oftentimes would think you'd have to stagger those in a certain way where, let's say, half the field is starting at 1, the other half is starting at 10, where the turn would take place. But we've talked about with men's golf earlier this year, sometimes they're starting on the 13th hole. Yep. They have to stagger them in such a way that there's not a complete log jam to get everybody in and make sure that they can get the scores that they need to. But head coach Mimi Burke and company sitting 10th for the North Florida Invitational down in Jacksonville. They will finish up the week with another tournament as they head to Augusta this weekend for the Valspar Intercollegiate Saturday and Sunday. A big weekend for Georgia Southern Rifle. They just got back into town just a few minutes ago over to the Shooting Sports Education Center. And but we're going to take you live. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Wish we could. No, no. <laughs> you know there's that line. With... No. <laughs> the, the line is actually in the middle of this table, right? <laughs> yeah, and we're right straddling. <laughs> but Georgia Southern Rifle claiming the 2022 SOCON Rifle Tournament. The first ever in program history to take the full conference crown. You remember last year, Georgia Southern won the air rifle crown right. in the SOCON. This year, Georgia Southern won both the small board title on Saturday and then took second in the air rifle with a 23-37 to post a conference meet record 46-03 in the aggregate to hold off their rival North Georgia by nine points. That's getting it done. It just sounded like straight domination. Yeah. It's something that that program has been building towards. The success has been there. The youth that they had continuing to win, continuing to get better, starting to put some gaps in between them and the rest of the competition. But to go to a conference championship setting to basically sweep all the major awards, no more co-athlete of the year, yep. what Ashley Judson had the previous two years, yep. sold this time. And for Coach Warman, no more co-coach of the year, unquestionably the best coach this year in the Southern Conference. Yeah, there, there's a lot of individual awards. Ashley Judson and Kinsley Hannon both advanced to the finals of the Air Rifle Relay, which that event in and of itself sounds like a lot of fun to watch because I have a picture in my head which probably isn't anywhere close to what an Air Rifle Relay actually is. Yeah, that's true. But it, in my head, it's a relay race with also Air Rifle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't seem safe. Careful. Yeah, right. Ashley Judson took fourth. And Hansen took the bronze medal individually in the air rifle relay. Aaron Ballard was named the small bore athlete of the year. Ashley Judson, as you mentioned, named air rifle athlete of the year. And Coach Sandra Warman was named the coach of the year in the SOCON. Had a first team all small bore in the Southern Conference. Aaron Ballard, Amy Visconti, and Ashley Judson, all three getting first team all conference small bore. 
First team all-conference air rifle was Ashley Judson and Amy Visconti. Aaron Ballard and Kinsley Hannon both took second team all-SOCON air rifle. And then the pinnacle award, the highest GPA on championships team, Ashley Judson gets the pinnacle award. So a lot of hardware coming home to Statesboro. I think that might have filled up the bus. Now we're going to have to figure a way to get them back on 94.9. Yes, and it probably is not going to... They might go Dwayne Grice style and go two hours. <laughs> They've earned it, though. Oh, no They've doubt. absolutely earned it. Huge congratulations going out to Georgia Southern Rifle. We're going to try to get them on coming up next week to talk about what it was like up at VMI, who was hosting the SOCON tournament. But Georgia Southern men's tennis getting things going they've got two this week after getting a victory six to one against south carolina state on sunday at the wallace tennis center they'll return home for a friday matchup against mercer for a two o'clock first serve and then head over to birmingham alabama on sunday to take on the uab blazers georgia southern women's tennis Supposed to have a three-match week, but because of COVID concerns, the Jacksonville match that was supposed to be tomorrow has been canceled at home. And then it's time for Sunbelt Conference play. Appalachian State and Coastal Carolina coming to the Wallace Tennis Center this weekend. The Mountaineers, a 10 a.m. first serve on Saturday, and then 10 a.m. the first serve on Sunday for Georgia Southern against Coastal Carolina. Georgia Southern softball, a little bit of a tough week this past week. Made it way down to Florida and sprint pretty much the whole week in florida thursday they were at jacksonville i know shucks rough yeah madeira beach <laughs> could do worse well, they were the northern part we were in the panhandle all right because chad when he came down yeah, after he stopped women finished, he stopped in jacksonville that's right yeah. i forgot about that that's right but he they were at jacksonville on thursday fell six to five to the dolphins and they made their way over to madeira beach for the spring games at madeira beach there's a lot of softball tournaments that happen in Florida that are, and we talked about it last week, you have to have a big softball complex. There are times where you've got 5, 10, 15 teams at some of them oh, yeah. all at once. Without a doubt. But this one, Georgia Southern faced off against five different opponents. They fell 2-1 to one to Albany on Friday, then Saturday, split the day with a one nothing victory over Rhode Island on Sunday afternoon, or Saturday afternoon, rather. Saturday evening, they fell to future Southern or Southern Conference Sunbelt Conference member in Southern Miss eight to one. Then on Sunday, fell in both Nebraska Omaha three nothing on Sunday morning. Then Sunday afternoon, a eight inning affair, but a nine to eight victory for Middle Tennessee over Georgia Southern. And now it's time for Sunbelt Conference play for head coach Sharon Perkins and company with Georgia Southern softball as they will head to ULM to take on the Warhawks Friday, Saturday, and Sunday softball going back to much like it did the year prior to last year. Last year was more of the doubleheaders and then single because of COVID and travel concerns. But this year, going back to the three-game series on three separate days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 5 o'clock on Friday, 2 o'clock Saturday, and noon on Sunday for Georgia Southern at ULM. One, glad they're back on the field. Yes. Two, the shutout against Rhode Island. Riley Waldrop tossed a shutout. She went the entire way. I know she's had a bit of a rough start to the season, but it's proof that there is something still in that tank, and that's someone that they're going to have to have with conference play beginning, especially on the road against the ULM squad. Diving into what it was like in Pensacola, Georgia Southern women's basketball getting a first-round victory in the Sunbelt Conference basketball tournament. It was the 7th seed Georgia Southern to open up in the first round, the last game of the first round against the 10th seed Georgia State Panthers. Ended up being an 88-79 victory for Georgia Southern over Georgia State. First time in Georgia Southern history to win a Sunbelt Conference tournament game. You look back at some of the games that Georgia Southern has had last year, it was a tough one against Texas State, but I think back to one of the first few times that Georgia Southern was in the Sunbelt Conference tournament back down in New Orleans at Lakefront Arena. It was the three-overtime game against Louisiana. I still think that game might be going on. (laughs) That was the longest game I'd ever been a part of. But Georgia Southern gets the victory 88-79 over the Georgia State Panthers. It's one that Georgia Southern led by 26 with about six minutes to play in the third quarter. It had been a crazy day for the women's basketball tournament already. Started off with Asia Blunt, 41 points in the opener against for Coastal Carolina. Yeah. Then you had one where ULM, who hadn't won a Sunbelt Conference game all year, was taking Little Rock to the wire. It, it had been a crazy day. 
but 26 points with three minutes to play in the third quarter. And then Georgia State battles back. They got it to within four with about three minutes to play in the game. But Georgia Southern able to hold it off for an 88-79 victory. Over the Georgia State Panthers, Maya Burns with 20 points had really good first half. Three of five from behind the arc. 17 points for Taryn Ward, 14 for Janiah Lovehill, and 19 for Taya Gibson. You've got to think, the way this tournament used to be structured in another year, Georgia Southern wouldn't even have been going to New Orleans or Pensacola, yeah. which is why this gap existed for a while, because for a time it was top eight, it was top ten, but now with top 12 on each side, everybody gets a chance to win it, but everybody gets a chance to simply get a win. Not necessarily with everybody reaching out for Monday trying to get that championship. You've got to start somewhere. And maybe this is like with volleyball. Yeah. Getting that first victory in conference tournament play. But to see that that, I guess it's almost like a breakthrough. Yeah. And to play that well, to shoot nearly 60% for much of that game. Yeah. And you knew that UT Arlington was going to be a bear player of the year, Star Jacobs, coach of the year as well. But to have that kind of performance going into that matchup, and especially against Georgia State, that's good. That's good stuff. So you get the first round victory, and because of the way the tournament was scheduled, that was on Wednesday. Thursday, it was all men's basketball, so women's basketball got the day off, and then you return on Friday. It was against the UT Arlington Mavericks. UTA ended up with an 85-76 victory over Georgia Southern, but really good game again for Taya Gibson. 16 points, 10 rebounds, a fantastic tournament, and really a really good last two, three weeks of the season that Tay has had been a huge part of Georgia Southern women's basketball. 13 points for Taryn Ward as well, but just couldn't get the three ball to fall. Just three of 18 in the game for 16% for as well as they shot in the first game against Georgia State. A little bit surprising to see, and they didn't shoot. It didn't get the first three until the fourth quarter. Well, Star Jacobs was really good. Too. Uh, well, that she, too. She was, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. We had a chance to watch most of that game. She was spectacular. Yeah, she finished with 28 points, 9 rebounds. She's There's a reason she's the player of the year. So as we're finishing up Georgia Southern baseball against Miami, Ohio to start the weekend, we end up transitioning over to women's basketball. We were watching to help score, and then the men actually went and attended both women's games. They caught both, both parts of the very women's nice. game. Very nice. And for the first round game for the men, the women came in. Ah, very nice. Yeah. So I did well. see, and I think it was the first round game for the men, of course, the cheerleaders and Gus and yep. Southern Pride were there. But is it the first round men's game that Gus kind of forgot that last step on the court? Okay. I, I just saw the video. It made me think of it. If he came to Pensacola with teeth, he did not leave <laughs> with teeth. <laughs> he still had that smile on. That was pretty impressive. He's yeah, like he, Scooter. We can't do much about that. But greatly appreciate Southern Pride, the cheerleaders, Gus, for being there. That That's not an easy trip, but no. for them to be down there, to see them behind the basket, made it feel like a little bit of Hanner Fieldhouse and a little bit of Eagle Nation made its way to the Emerald Coast. That was cool. So Georgia Southern women's season finishes with a final record of 18-10, and 10, the most wins that Georgia Southern has had since the 2009-2010 season. So you're looking at over a decade the most wins in the season, and you lose to essentially – what turned out to be the Sunbelt Conference Tournament champion. UTA knocked off Troy by 15 earlier on this afternoon. Not a whole lot to shake your head about. You had beaten UT Arlington early in the season. You knew it was going to be a tough test. UT Arlington kept getting better as the season went on when you beat them earlier in the year. They were without a couple of their key players coming into that game. And so while it's still good to have that win over UTA, you knew there was a very different UT Arlington team that you saw down in the tournament. But a good season for Georgia Southern women's basketball comes to a close again, 18-10 and 10 the overall record, 8-6 and six in Sunbelt Conference play. Almost everybody in the country loses that final game unless you win it all or you go to a situation where there's no postseason tournament and you just get an automatic bid that still exists here and there. But there is such a thing as taking momentum into the offseason, getting that first tournament victory, being able to use that as a recruiting tool, and this program can come back even better once 22 rolls around. Georgia Southern men's basketball also down in Pensacola. I really like that they had all 24 teams, 12 on the men, 12 on the women's side, all in the Pensacola Bay Center. That was a really cool feature, and obviously because the year prior at Pensacola State College did not go as well as hoped. No, and I don't think that that's something we're going to have to worry about anymore. No, I don't think so either. 
But Georgia Southern started off in the 7-10 matchup as well, flipped on the head of what Georgia Southern women's had had, where women were the 7th seed. This time men were the 10th seed against the 7th seed Coastal Carolina. And it ended up being a 70-64 to victory for Georgia Southern. They led by 10 at halftime and did a really good job. And I, I say really good job on Vince Cole. 17 points. He was only 5 of 14 from the floor, 2 of 6 from 3, and never... It's hard to say you did a really good job on somebody defensively when they only had 17, but I think Vince Cole showed what he could do, especially against Georgia Southern earlier, just a couple of weeks ago in Conway. And it looked like he was never as comfortable as he wanted to be on that day. I think he took two open shots the entire game. Most of the time when he was catching or about to do his thing, somebody was up on him, whether it was Caden Archie, Grant Weatherford, Trey Cobbs, because Georgia Southern switches on all their screens. Everybody had a chance to try to shut him down, and it was a motivated defense considering just how much he dominated that February game up in Conway. He made six threes. He started eight of eight from the field. He was Jeez. more than doubling up Georgia Southern for a while with the number of points that he had about eight and a half minutes into the game. But we've talked on this podcast and during broadcast before how Georgia Southern has either put together a good first half or a good second half. Yeah, Rarely against a D1 team, did it all come together. That 40 minutes was the best 40 minutes against a D1 opponent this year. And thankful that the team could play its best in tournament time. Brian Burke has said over and over and over again, play your best basketball once you get to March, once you get to tournament play. Ultimately, it did not extend, but to see what that team was capable of, locking in for those 40 minutes against a really good offensive team to get his first win as a head coach in tournament play. He could take momentum from that as a recruiting tool and go into next season. It was the second double-digit seed that had knocked off the higher seed in the day. So Georgia Southern would move on to quarterfinal action. They knew they would be taking on the number two seed in the Appalachian State Mountaineers. But something we've talked about a lot, and that victory over Coastal Carolina really started to make my mind work of something we had talked about, how similar the transition that has been under Brian Berg here in Georgia Southern, now his second season just coming to a close, as it was at Troy with Scott Cross. They won a game in the tournament last year. Correct. And I was trying to go back and remember, they were a double-digit seed last year that ended up upsetting a higher seed in the tournament. And I don't think it was the 7-10 matchup. It was the 11-6. The 11-6. Because they, they beat Arlington. But it, it's so similar, and to see what Troy is doing now, I think it gives a lot of hope of how many similarities there is between the two. And I, I don't mean to keep harping on it, but every time something happens, it seems to keep falling in line. And now these coaches are able to do something that they haven't been able to do much of any whatsoever. Brian Berg's actually on the road. Huh. There were two off-seasons where, yeah. because you had the statutes lifted – midway through the second cycle but now those coaches season over they can go back to what is normal to them right zoom is still going to be a part of what they do because we found out how valuable it can be to still create relationships but nothing is going to replace that interpersonal interaction the handshake maybe even a hug if it goes really well (laughs) and being able to get in front of a family be in their home be able to hang out before they actually commit part of their lives to come play and to come be a student at Georgia Southern. After the victory for Georgia Southern, 70-64 to over Coastal Carolina would move on to a 73-60 victory for Appalachian State over Georgia Southern. And it was one, the first half was not what Georgia Southern was looking for, couldn't find the shot that they were looking for in the first half. The second half was better, but it was a little bit too late. Never got closer than six after it was initially, I think, App scored the first 10 points. Eagles missed 11 of their first 12 shots, and then it had to be at least 10 times where Georgia Southern had shots at the rim, and for whatever reason, the ball just did not want to go in. I think about the last five minutes that there were two on one possession that rolled around and touched all areas. I mean, you can't say sides because the circle doesn't have sides. It's a circle. It doesn't have corners. You go around all all parts of the rim. <laughs> yes, Chuck and Larry. It is still it's still a thing, but it just kept going. And both of them fell off. And I'm th- sitting there thinking that that's that's that game. Yeah, that was that game. But 
Caden Archie was terrific. He's had games where he scored more at Georgia Southern, but he made three threes. That was a career high, and he's been in college for four years now. This is his third different stop. Now with some of these guys, we know we honored the six seniors before the ULM game, but those were guys that had academically qualified with four years' worth of school, and that's what Brian Berg wanted to do for those guys that had earned the spot to get their jerseys framed. But ultimately, you don't know who's going to return next year. Yeah, The two you're for sure not getting back – are Grant Weatherford and Trey Cobbs. Their their eligibility is finally done. <laughs> yeah, the NCAA is done with Grant Weatherford. <laughs> Grant with seven, Trey with six. Special part of your heart goes out to them for making this their final stop, making one more go of it. And for Trey, this is somebody that had a lot of success at Northern Kentucky. He was yeah. a role player. He was more towards the end of the bench, but part of two NCAA tournaments in Northern Kentucky when Chris Shumay was an assistant there, also in NIT when he was playing for the Norsemen. But for Grant, who has had just about every injury conceivable over the course of his <laughs> career, he, he, this is something that we just found out this year. He's got a very different kind of shot, and I found out why because he showed me there's actually a pretty big scar in between his thumb and his pointer finger. He shattered his right hand before his freshman year of high school. Huh. He played that season left-handed. What? This was basically just out there as a paperweight. He played his freshman season of basketball left-handed. Did he have a cast on? Yes. That's fantastic. Played his freshman season left-handed, and because there was a plate in his hand, he said for a couple of years, whenever they would have to fly, he would set off the metal detector, and he would have to convince <laughs> the people at the airport, like, whoa, 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 I'm not, I'm not doing anything. It's the plate in my head. So, but eventually, the bone grew around it, but his hand can only hurt, hold the basketball a certain way, so that's why his shot looks a little bit different. Huh. But he has had to figure out, almost he's had to relearn how to shoot. Right. But the leadership that he provided for that team for two years, on and off the court, is something that this program is going to miss. I really wish for those two it would have gone a little bit longer this week, but you only get one year with Trey. Yeah. You, you knew that it was going to be the one year after he transferred in. I'll always hate when the season's over even though we do now primarily focus on baseball for the rest of the athletic year. But you always hate to see it end because you know that for some of those guys, their careers are over. Again, it was a 73-60 victory for Appalachian State over Georgia Southern. App State would move on, and then they would fall in the quarterfinals, or in the semifinals, rather, against Georgia State, 71-66. So the Sunbelt Conference Championship coming up on ESPN2, I believe. A little bit later on, in about 30 minutes ish from now, as the eight seeded Louisiana, who had a pretty fun run so far. But a eight seed Louisiana will take on the number three seed Georgia State tonight. That one coming up at about seven o'clock or thereabouts. Yeah, the human interest piece with that is you've already got them beating number nine Arlington, number one Texas State, and then number four Troy just to get there. Bob Marlin lost his mom earlier this week. Oh, I didn't realize that. And it was on his birthday, too. So he, huh. so in the day in between, he actually went back to be with her for that one last day, and then she passed away. So there's a lot more that I'm sure is going to try to propel the occasions to get back to the tournament for the first time in eight years. I'm sure there's a lot of heavy vermilion and white hearts down there at Pensacola right now going against a Georgia State team where it is their league. I don't, I don't like saying that because it's especially us, but – that that's that's going to be one to watch regardless of how it goes. That's not too terribly far from Lafayette. Five Probably hours. five. Yeah. yeah. Not too. And heck, those cha those Cajuns will travel anywhere. They were. Yeah, they were there. <laughs> Georgia State traveled very well. Arkansas really? State. Yeah. Arkansas State's fans. You would have thought they brought the entire county with them. They almost took up the entire huh. lower bowl. Wow. On the bench side. And, but you got the player of the year, North Shadow Mirror, of course. Well, I mean, you you want to get a chance to watch him. True. It, it was it was a cool atmosphere, though, watching different fan bases and teams taking center stage and then watching some leave, different the different colors leave, and then the other colors come and sit down. I, I think they might have something with Pensacola, much like we talked about before with baseball. Montgomery is – that's a spot. Oh, yeah. It that's does not perfect. need to leave Montgomery. No, baseball ever. should stay right there. Basketball might have something with Pensacola. I liked it. Huh. Actually getting to see the base center. A year ago, couldn't make that. Couldn't give you that assessment because I didn't see it. Right. Interesting. 
I think a lot of people's ideas of what Pensacola was changed this year based on the fact that... Because, I mean, last year you had, what, four, eight teams that never saw the base center? And the area where the Eagles and there were four teams total in our hotel, the area that we were in was shut down last year because of COVID. Oh, that's right. So you were only restricted to be in a certain part of Pensacola. might have made for a little bit longer trip to wherever you were going to play. Huh. But last year, it was still restrictions. Remember, they had to clear the entire arena before each game to sanitize. That's right. I forgot Look, about that. We're being clean. We're not saying right. we're not sanitizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was a, okay, everybody out. With you the two big teams, foggers. Yeah, you guys got to wait. We got to sanitize this entire arena. Huh. Interesting. But the Sunbelt Conference Championship tournaments, again, the women finishing up earlier on today as UT Arlington defeated Troy by 15. And in about 30 minutes from now, it'll be the 8-seed Louisiana against the 3-seed Georgia State later on tonight on ESPN2. But men's basketball finishes up the season 13-16 and 16 overall, 5-11 and 11 in conference play. But we've talked about it so many times. There have been so many glimpses of what this team could be. And I think the first round game against Coastal Carolina, like you talked about, the best 40 minutes put together yeah. against a D1 opponent this year, I think you see what the Brian Berg, Berg era is going to look like. And I don't think it's too distant in the future. When all four tires get on the road, just... Just get ready. Did you do that because the conference tournament was sponsored by a co- tire company? No, that was a very fortunate turn of phrase. But once all the tires are on the road, just be patient. Georgia Southern Baseball had themselves one heck of a week while basketball was in I, Pensacola. I can't speak about any of this. I, I mean, I, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I followed along on Wednesday, had a chance to watch Friday, but Saturday, Sunday, we're in transit. Did follow on stat broadcast, but you did a thing this week. <laughs> well, I had to make up for opening weekend. Yeah. Because well, I got my tail kicked opening well, weekend. Well, just like Coach Hannah says, you're getting 1% better. You're starting to do the little things. and With a lot of guys. 36 runs in four <laughs> games, hit 313 as a squad. Hey, that'll work. There you go. Six and five. Everything's hey, fine. figured it out. Everything's fine. <laughs> I got us back over 500. We're all right. <laughs> Now the two of us can get together. We can have the magic going. We'll, We're good. We'll go to the river tomorrow. We'll have a good time. Yeah. But it started on Tuesday <laughs> down in Jacksonville, and that was a game you didn't really know what to expect. It was a Jacksonville team that had come in 6-1. and one. We yeah. had talked about it last week, how they had defeated Florida State earlier on the previous midweek. Soften them up for the Eagles later Yeah, this year. Just, just getting them ready. Appreciate you guys. And... <laughs> Getting to the ballpark, that's the first time I've ever been to Jacksonville's ballpark. Yeah, I haven't been there either. I really like it. It's not the biggest, not the most glamorous, luxurious. Well, the way the ball flew that night, it definitely wasn't. <laughs> which I didn't expect <laughs> because down the first base line, there's a road. On the other side of the road is the water. And so you were thinking, okay, it's not necessarily blowing straight out, whatever. And it's a big ballpark. I mean, 405 to center, 340 down each of the lines. And it's probably a 10, 15 foot high wall all the way around. And so I'm thinking, okay, there, there's going to be a lot of doubles, but there's not going to be a whole lot of bombs. Well, boy, was I wrong. 13 7 later. <laughs> yeah, right. Ended up being a 13 to 7 victory for Georgia Southern over Jacksonville. A really back and forth game and a really good game between these two. Georgia Southern got it started in the top of the first inning when Noah Ledford hit a bomb to right center are we talking auburn 19 bomb or not quite okay but that thing flew okay and then you had blake delama <laughs> lord who didn't have a home run in his career hit two in back-to-back at bats yeah the first one that rivals one of the farthest balls i've seen hit that thing was crushed okay but georgia southern able to Get it into a 13-7 to victory for Georgia Southern over Jacksonville. Really good to see Will Robbins come back. He's somebody that we had heard a lot about mm-hmm. during the recruiting process of how good the breaking ball was. He only goes two innings coming back from the injury. But he came back, had two innings, looked really good. The numbers, just two hits, one run, two walks, no strikeouts on 42 pitches. Did give up the first home run to Delamalur, but... 
he is somebody that's going to be special for Georgia Southern. He's got that big sweeping breaking ball, the big curve ball. When he gets it to where he can mix it the way he wants to, and we're going to see him tomorrow night against Georgia down at SRP Park, that's somebody that's going to be pretty dangerous for Georgia Southern, I think. It was going to be a shorter outing regardless because right. he was coming back from injury, but he got into some three ball counts early and he only went the two innings. Thankfully, those that came in behind him did pretty well, especially Javon Ray and then with yeah. Jay Thompson able to come in along with Thomas Ross to ultimately finish it. But man, the bats. Yeah. I, I, I would love to spend the entire hour talking about Will Robbins no because joke. he's got enough of a personal list of accomplishments from high school that we could. Well, hopefully that'll be for next week. Uh, that's hopefully. If he gets stretched out a little right. bit tomorrow. But, but offensively, with Ledford's bomb, all the extra base hits, Sam finally getting some hits with the bases loaded, didn't yeah. have that for really the back half of last year. And somebody that was a huge part of this, Noah Cersei. The Jacksonville native, he had so many family and friends that was sitting right in front of us. It was awesome to see every time he came up, it was like a whole section stood up. <laughs> it was awesome. But Cersei goes three for four, had three RBIs, a pair of doubles, scored run, scored two runs as well, walked. He was somebody that, that was the Noah Cersei that we have been waiting for. We've seen glimpses of it in his previous couple of years. But that is the Noah Cersei that we knew could come out, and it carried on throughout the weekend, too. His word carries a lot of weight in the dugout. No doubt. And I don't know that there is a more respected player on that roster no. than Noah Cersei. I don't know. That, I'll take that a step further. I don't know that there has been a more respected player in my time here. Baseball. Correct. And wow. And that that goes a good ways back. That goes to Chase Griffin. That goes to Orion Cleveland. Evan Challenger. Evan Challenger. There's a lot of guys, Seth Schumann. But I don't know that there is one that is more respected in my time here. To see that he's finally becoming an everyday guy because for four years it was spot duty because the Eagles had crowded outfields. Right. So he was mostly pinch hit, get a start every now and then against a lefty. But he has turned himself into someone that's looking at almost an everyday start. He can play either corner. He's got a really accurate arm from the outfield. You know he's got enough to slug. Yeah. But he also hits the ball to all fields. Power guys that hit the ball to all fields definitely get you into baseball. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> like the two out RBIs we always talk sure. about. But. but, And he's somebody that I think the biggest change is the approach. He has such a good approach this past week. And that goes to a huge credit to the work that he and Alan Beck have put in the off season. His approach, yes, he's a power guy, and you could say the same thing about Noah Ledford. We'll talk about in a little bit, but Ledford as well, along with Cersei, are power guys, but are also looking for the pitch to drive. You can go up there and take monster hacks all you want to, but if you don't get the pitch you're looking for, it doesn't do you any good. And so Cersei has gone up with the approach of getting the pitch and then the secondary is trying to hammer it. There is a line you've got to toe between being patient and being aggressive. You've got to know what your pitch is because what Cersei's pitch is isn't what Ledsford's pitch is, isn't right. what Austin Thompson's pitch is, Correct. isn't what Jesse Sherrill's pitch is. But the fact that this team has been so dedicated to increasing their walks a year ago, it was the fewest walks in nearly 30 years for a team that's still got to the tournament championship game for the fourth time in five years. But if they can take just a few more, just a few more, let those continue to add up because eventually the odds are somebody's going to make a mistake. Yep. No doubt. Move into a three-game series against the Miami of Ohio Redhawks that came in with a 3-4 and four record, but we talked about it last week, a much better team than what that 3-4 and four record shows. And I know Georgia Southern swept this weekend, that's a Miami of Ohio team that's going to give a lot of people trouble in the MAC. I promise you, that lineup is one of uh, Billy Bean would love that lineup because <laughs> that's a team that gets on base, and that's a team a lot like we talked about with Cersei with an approach of trying to find the right pitch, trying to find a way to get on base. They just kept coming. Yes, and they never stopped. They just all weekend. kept coming every all three one run yes. games. Two of those ended up being walk offs. 
there were multiple times in each game where it could have been, oh, Georgia Southern will win comfortably. Yep. Let's come back and do it again tomorrow. They never stopped. No. It, it was – I was really impressed with a lot of guys in that Miami-Ohio lineup. J.J. Woolwine, the leadoff guy, it, somebody should have gotten a trophy for getting that guy out. <laughs> I, it, there's not many people that I'll be like, that That dude's good. J.J. Woolwine is somebody that played a really good right field – really good at getting on base and he is exactly what you want in a leadoff hitter add that to the list of really good and really fast leadoff hitters that georgia southern has already seen yeah. through 11 games this season going to see another one tomorrow with ben yep. anderson who has given georgia southern a lot of problems over the two years that they have faced him but you need somebody like that and when jesse Sherrill comes back we know he yep. didn't play all last week and georgia southern won four games yep. that's a real big part of this that goes unnoticed you score 36 games, you hit better than 310 collectively without your leadoff guy. Yep. So it was patchwork in some ways in that respect. But getting back to Woolwine, I want to see what he does the rest of the year. Yeah, I do too. I, I, I will be keeping an eye on what he does the rest of the year. There's always a team or two that we play that is kind of out of left field. Georgia Southern hadn't seen this team since 1976. The only other time that the two had played. Jack Stallings' first year. Right. <laughs> I was <laughs> asking that? I was asking Coach Hennon about the series and how it came about in the pregame interview. And he, I said something like, it's the first time that the Eagles had seen since 1976. He goes, well, I don't know what they did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I know that, but you get what I'm saying. Anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> He would have been seven? something like that six or seven yeah Uh, this is a a little tot a little one well (laughs) this is a team that and there's always one or two a year that just kind of come out of left field that nobody's really paid attention to a whole lot that i'll follow the rest of the year and oklahoma from a year ago really liked that program all around this is a miami of ohio team that's going to go to the my favorites on the b1 baseball at the top Jonathan Brand is going to be good enough to win them a lot of games. He oh, comes yeah. here, gives up one hit, 10 strikeouts in five innings, but because Jalen Payton was just a little bit better, yeah. Eagles got a narrow victory on Friday. They had a frontline guy, one of the best pitchers nationally last year in Bachman. He goes ninth overall to the Angels, triple digit with a fastball, outstanding slider. He's on fast track to get to the big leagues whenever that resumes. But – I'm also anxious to see what they can do in tournament play because, remember, the MAC hasn't had the tournament the last two years. They called That's it right. off last year. So Central Michigan was the regular season champion. They got the auto bid. That's right. I forgot. This is a this is a tournament team. This team is built for the tournament. For the MAC tournament? Yes. Okay. Built for it. But you talked about Jalen Payton. Five and a third innings of work, set a new career high, six strikeouts, another career high. And he is somebody that he looked so confident we talked about it on Friday with him after the game, especially with the fastball. That's the most confidence I've seen in his fastball since he's been here. And, and he didn't need to use his secondary. No, didn't really need to use the secondary, but he worked ahead in the count, which is something that Coach Hennon had talked about before the game. Got to have a little bit of length out of Jalen. You wanted a little bit of length the rest of the weekend from the starters. Didn't get as long as you would like. But Jalen Payton really set the tone for the weekend on that Friday night start, five and a third innings. You see fastballs that have life. You hear that phrase, a fastball that's got some run, but some some sizzle, some life. Yeah. Watching the stream, his fastball was live on Friday. No doubt. Georgia Southern ended up scoring in the bottom of the fifth inning on a Jarrett Brown leadoff double. He would come home on a error that Jason Swan had popped it up to Blake Buzio at second. Buzio dropped it, and as a Braves fan, it made me think of Brooks Conrad, but... We'll get past that. Sounds like you have. <laughs> yeah. Ten years now? Infield fly. Okay. Two more come across the plate in the sixth inning for Georgia Southern. The eighth inning is a point that Georgia Southern loaded the bases with one out in the se- in the seventh inning, rather. Loaded the bases with one out, and then the next two are retired. A strikeout from Ty, a ground out by Jarrett Brown. That's one that you felt like, ooh, Miami of Ohio is trying to take a little bit back. They score one in the top of the eighth. Georgia Southern answers was one in the bottom of the eighth. Miami has one in the top of the ninth to cut to a four to three lead. Had the tying run on base, but thankfully Jay Thompson comes in 
and Old Reliable shuts it down for his second save of the season. And Georgia Southern gets the 4-3 to three victory on Friday night. And you're like, man, this was a really good college baseball game. What's the rest of the weekend going to hold? You didn't know. And <laughs> you couldn't have guessed I, what I it was mean, going to. Ends up being a 9-8 victory for Georgia Southern on Friday, or on Saturday, rather. A walk-off home run by Jason Swan to lead off the 10th inning. Again, after Miami of Ohio battles back, Eagles lead 8-6 going to the ninth. Two runs come across on a two-run bomb off the bat of Steven Krause, which Steven Krause had only started one game coming into the weekend. He ends up hitting three bombs. I think he earned himself a little bit of a lineup spot. And one that ties the game with two outs in the yeah, ninth inning. Right. I think he's okay in that lineup. But he hits a bomb to left field to tie the game at eight in the ninth inning. But huge innings by Thomas Ross in this one. He ends up getting the victory. He comes in in the ninth to get the final out after Willie Escala had singled in the ninth inning with two outs. And then he goes one, two, three on six pitches in the tenth inning. And that's exactly what you needed because Georgia Southern had a little momentum in the bottom of the ninth inning. As Jalen Payton pinch hit, he walks, moves to second on a ground out by Blake Evans, and then the inning ends in the ninth. You go to the tenth inning right after you had just been up to bat six pitches before, and Jason Swan says, okay, we can go home now. You only needed three pitches in that inning. Yeah. Just three. That's it. That's and all you need. The, <laughs> from his bad flip, uh, yeah, he knew. Yeah, and everybody mm-hmm. knew it. He knew. That's one that it wasn't a, okay, it's going. No, it's gone. There's no going. We know how strong Swan is. It hasn't necessarily translated to home runs. We've seen him hit a couple of home runs. He knocked one. He only had one last year was at Coastal where everybody hits home runs. (laughs) But to win a game and to knock one 420 plus to win a game. Yeah. That one was crushed. And Georgia Southern hadn't had a walk-off homer in eight years. That's bizarre to me. Yeah. Striker Brown. Striker Brown. It was a one nothing game to beat Western. Jesus. May 10th, 2014, the last walk-off. With all the guys that have had so much power in this program, that was the last walk-off home run. Not a Cleveland, not a McWhorter. Striker Brown. Not an Aaron Bizell. Striker Brown. If you have that on your bingo card, you're lying. Yes, come on. You're lying. So Jason Swan had the first RBI of the day on Saturday and the last, and it ended up being a 9-8 victory for Georgia Southern. Really good work out of the bullpen by Jake Martin. He goes two and two-thirds innings of work, gives up two runs, but really good work out of the bullpen. And Hayden Harris, Coach Hennon talked about it on Sunday, he goes three innings. He had the life back on his fastball. Everybody remembers the home run that he gives up to Steven Krause to tie the game in the ninth. But if he doesn't give you those first two innings where he struck out the best hitter in Cole Andrews for Miami of Ohio, he struck him out twice, you don't get to that point in the game. And so everybody remembers the home run, but the previous two and two-thirds innings were really good from Harris. And I would anticipate seeing him tomorrow. Yeah, I think so. Being that this is a homecoming for him, I, I would anticipate that Rodney Hennon will do whatever he can to get Harris a, at least a couple of batters tomorrow night. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. But Georgia Southern walks it off with a 9-8 victory in 10 innings on Saturday, and then you turn the tide to Sunday. You're thinking it can't get a whole lot better, and then it does. But it's baseball, man. But a 10-9 to victory, another walk-off for Georgia Southern. Danny Madden goes three-plus innings of work. Brooks Gorman was really good. Three innings out of the bullpen, allowing two hits, one unearned run on 38 pitches. And Javon Ray, who ends up getting the win, I really like him. Two wins this week. I'm a huge fan of Javon Ray. Throw the slider for a strike. He's going to be even better. Yeah. Inning in two-thirds, just one hit, no runs, and a strikeout on 15 pitches. But Georgia Southern, again, having to battle back against the Miami team that scored the first three in the game. Eagles got one at the bottom of the third inning, but Georgia Southern finds themselves down by a 9-8 score in the eighth inning. Georgia Southern battles back, bottom of the ninth. Noah Ledford had a huge double to lead off the ninth inning, just crushed it down the left field line. He gets sacrificed over by Parker Beatier. Thompson's hit by a pitch. You got runners on the corners, and then you have Sean White comes in to pinch hit, 
RBI ground out to tie the game at nine. Kyler Holtgren comes in. He gets hit by a pitch. So you've got runners on first and second. And Jarrett Brown to the plate. And he's down 1-2. And you're thinking, okay, we might be going to the 10th and we're going to try this extra inning thing again. Yeah, we've done this before. Yeah, we've seen this story before. Swans do up second. We're fine. <laughs> but Jarrett Brown comes through. <laughs> and one of the softest hits that he may have all season, infield was in. Actually, runners on first and third. Infield was in. And Jarrett Brown, just a little poke shot over the second baseman's head. You didn't realize it was going to clear Buzzio's head until he leaped and came back down and he didn't have the ball. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. Jordan Sutherland just walked it off. Jarrett Brown, RBI single. Time to go home. 10-9 victory. Not a way to do it. And he's somebody that's been going through a little bit of a rough patch to start the season. Yeah. And just something like that, something so small, Find a gap, whether they're in, whether they're back, whatever. He won a game. Yeah. He won a game. And he's somebody that had a really good weekend. Five for 11 on the weekend. Drew a couple of walks. Really good at bats. But he's somebody that it's starting to come around here in the later parts of the non-conference portion. We know that he's got the backside power. He yeah. was he lived in the right center field gap last year. Part of the reason why he hit four triples because he knew once the ball was going there, he was going to be able to run. He's bigger this year. So I think swing-wise, he has to understand how his body is going to adjust. That's somebody that can develop some pull side power, but he's going to make people remember that I'm going to go to that backside gap whenever I need yeah. to. You can try to play me this way all you want to, but if I'm going to go to that backside gap, I'm going to be able to hurt for extra bases, and I'm also going to be able to have a good enough approach where I can win a game and walk off for two straight games. Eagles will turn their attention to a five-game week, well, hopefully a five-game week weather, trying to play a little bit of wrench in the chain. It is always sunny at J.I. Clement Stadium. <laughs> Until it's not. Always. But on Tuesday, tomorrow, Georgia Southern will head up to SRP Park in North Augusta, South Carolina, home of the Augusta Green Jackets, now a low-A affiliate of the Atlanta Braves. The last time we were there, they were an affiliate of the San Francisco Giants. But a 635 first pitch when you go to a minor league ballpark, you got to have the 35 first pitch yeah. in case it's on the super stations. Or, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But take on the number 11 team in the country, some anywhere from 11 to 21 are we, are we doing this again? Yeah. I don't understand why. Like, how is there so much of a gap? College baseball, there's more of a gap in what the rankings are than any other sport. Like, you may have one or two off in football and basketball. Like, you're either number 13, 14, 15. But you don't have this. Like, Tennessee, they're anywhere from 4 to 32. Well, you've got to wait for the college football playoff rankings because ultimately after, what is it, week eight, those are the ones that get followed. Yeah. But for the first seven weeks, it's okay. AP coaches, and there can be some variance when you're talking football. But, yeah, with baseball, it just seems that there's a pretty substantial gap sometimes between where teams are actually situated. The highest that Georgia is ranked is number 11 in the country, and it's a team that comes in 9-2. and two. They won their first eight games of the season before falling in the first two out of three. They played Georgia Tech this weekend for three games, one at Russ Chandler Stadium, one at Foley Field in Athens, and then one up at Cool Ray, the home of the AAA Gwinnett Stripers up in Lawrenceville and Gwinnett County. Georgia lost the first two games of the series against Georgia Tech, ended up coming back to win in pretty big-time fashion against the Jackets on Sunday. But a lot of the same names, Ben Anderson you talked about, 382 average on the year, Cole Tate, Connor Tate, a lot of the same names that we've seen from years past for Scott Strickland and company. This year, we won't have to deal with seeing Jonathan Cannon make a midweek scarf because remember, he was coming Thank back goodness. last year from mono and about with COVID. He was only going to go two innings that game, but you could tell why he is considered a high draft prospect, somebody that's yeah. going to go very early once the draft comes up this summer. But for Georgia, this is a team that last weekend, they kind of got humbled a little bit. Oh, well, a year ago, they only went 31-25. and 25. They were under 500 in the SEC, missed out on the NCAA regionals. It's the first time they'd missed out in a couple of years. They weren't scoring, but they no. got everybody back in their minds thinking, okay, maybe get a little bit healthier with everybody back. I think you take away Riley Webb, but get everybody else back. 
Ben Anderson had to improve. He hit barely 200 last year, but he was dealing with a couple of different injuries and some bad luck, according to Coach Strickland. Their defense was very consistent last year. They're not defending that well no. lately. That's usually an infield where they make just about every routine play, except against Georgia Southern in 2020. <laughs> but Whoops. typically, they are a very good defensive team, yeah. and they figure it out with their pitching. I say figure it out because they walk a lot of guys. They walk close to five guys per game, so they're forced to strand a lot of guys on base if they win, but because their offense has been a little bit better so far, they've been able to mask that. They couldn't do it against Tech last weekend, and those were pretty convincing victories, especially yeah. getting shut out at home like they did. Yeah, I don't think that was one that anybody saw coming, but it hasn't necessarily been the toughest of schedules so far for Georgia. When is it? Oh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just. No, I mean, you're right. You're 100 percent right. They swept Albany in Athens. Two of those were two runs or less. Got the victory seven to one over Wofford on a midweek in Athens. Hosted Akron for three. For supposed to be four, ended up being three. Yeah. But Friday night, you just win one nothing against Akron. Cannon. That's why you have Jonathan Cannon. Right. You get the victory over Wofford again, 7-6, to six, this time at Floor Field in Greenville. They needed a run in the ninth inning to win that one, too. Right. And then you lose 11-7 to seven to Tech on Friday, 7 nothing against Tech on Saturday, which I'm sure that made everybody in Clark County very happy. And then the victory 12-3 on Sunday against Georgia Tech. This is one that... They did beat Alabama, though, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> did they? I hadn't heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Lord. I'm sure we'll hear that only 37 times. But it's one that this is a – they're top 25 for a reason. They're a top 25 team for sure. They're a top 25 team. I don't know that this is the best Georgia team that Georgia Southern has seen in the last few years, but they are still a top 25 really good Georgia team. The things that add to this matchup, one being at SRP Park, Georgia Southern is the home team, and I anticipate this being a really well-attended game because yes. you've got two teams in the same state. And look, I'm not acting like Clemson's 12 hours away. That was right. a, it was a reasonable trip for both. Good atmosphere there last year, but I anticipate this one being a really good atmosphere. And remember, Georgia Southern's won five of the last six. Yeah. Let's, let's not forget that little part of this rivalry. It's almost even all time. But Georgia Southern, ever since they scored seven runs on no hits in the final game of that series in 2019 to the sixth inning, they've won five of the last six games. I forgot about that one. Frank and Terry called that that night. Yes. Yes, they did. Seven runs, no hits, <laughs> won the game 10-7. Ever since that, they've won five of the last six in the series. Of course, swept 2020. That was fun. And they were on their way to take on Florida, who was yep. number one in the country. They were going down to Gainesville. They were number two at the time. They lost four games that year, three to Georgia Southern before the shutdown. That is one game that's part of two days that I will never forget. And we've talked about this before, that that was the last Georgia Southern athletic event of the season because that's when the next day the COVID shutdown happened. Yeah. I think that was March the 10th. 12th. The 12th. You play Georgia on the 12th. Those on the 11th. Or on the 11th, I mean. You play Georgia on the 11th, get that victory at home inside a packed J.I. Clemens Stadium. You mentioned they were going to number one Florida. They were number two at the time. They're going to number one Florida. They start the game thinking we're going to Florida. It's going to be slammed. We're rocking and rolling. By the fifth inning, Florida announced they're not going to have any fans. By the end of the game, they ended up staying in Statesboro because they weren't sure if they were going or not. Yep. Everybody gets the alerts that Rudy Gobert had tested positive in the N NBA. All of that started to go. The next day is when all the basketball tournaments started to go one by one, and that was eventually the day that the College World Series and all the NCAA postseason was canceled. That's the beginning of the two-day stretch that a lot of people will never forget. And this weekend, we'll get to William & Mary in just a moment, but... This weekend is the two-year anniversary of that. That's right. I hadn't put two and two together, but yes. I mean, we've got a lot to talk about with Georgia because this isn't just a Tuesday game in North Augusta. They come here on Wednesday. That should be close to a sellout crowd. Yeah. 
Some of the best crowds in J.I. Clement Stadium history have been when either Tech or Georgia are here. And then you get the three games this weekend against William and Mary before conference play starts next weekend. Yeah, talking to some of the folks over in the ticket office, if you're trying to get a ticket for Georgia Southern and Georgia on Wednesday at J.I. Clement Stadium, go and try to get it now because there's not a whole lot left. I would hope that maybe you break an attendance record. Certainly going to be in the top 10, but 2017's is the record right now just over 3,400. Let's break a record. Yeah, let's do it. Let's get a couple wins, break Why a record. Not? William & Mary, come on down. Yeah, come on. But it's a William & Mary team 5-3 and three on the year. They ended up sweeping Rhode Island to start the season with three pretty convincing victories. A very offensive team in William & Mary. They score a lot of runs. Fell to Richmond on the midweek. Had the next weekend a little bit tinkered with they're supposed to play maine and penn state in a tournament over in Cary, north carolina at the usa baseball complex both of those games get canceled turn around fall to virginia in up in charlottesville and then took two out of three this past weekend up in williamsburg in a tournament where they faced rutgers lafayette and princeton beat lafayette 21 to 9 by the way that's the leopards not the yeah cajuns. not the cajuns they were playing southern miss that we weekend. would not dare call the cajuns lafayette we're, we're to past, their face we're past all that kind of <laughs> they play tomorrow up in williamsburg against georgetown for a 330 first pitch so we will know what the record for william and mary is by the time probably by the time we go on air Think tomorrow so. somewhere around but again a 635 first pitch tomorrow from srp park in north augusta south carolina six o'clock first pitch on wednesday against number 11 georgia at j.i clement stadium and then 6.30, 2 o'clock, and 1 o'clock Friday through Sunday against William and Mary. Blew out on Wednesday for the Georgia game. And then this Saturday against William and Mary, it is another bark at the park. I think that went over pretty well for Miami of Ohio last weekend. Yeah, except... Oh, boy. <laughs> I have to give Mathis a little bit of grief. Mathis, one of the great additions to Georgia Southern in the marketing department. But about the eighth inning... He got this evil look in his eye, and he played a sound over the PA of dogs barking. <laughs> the entire stadium started barking. I thought you were going to play a dog whistle. <laughs> no, that would have been funny, too. He probably hadn't thought of that. But he played dogs barking, and the entire stadium, the dogs were barking. <laughs> it was awesome. You get a ball, too? <laughs> All right. Terry's not here, so we're going to set the record let, straight. Let's let's close on this. All right. <clears throat> so Sunday, we've talked about for years, what if a ball came through the window? It is a running gag. Right. And it's only about a two-foot opening, maybe? Yeah. About a two-foot opening right in front of what was my seat Sunday, what is now your seat again. Sunday. Well, it's my right arm and your left arm. Yeah, yeah. Wait, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's easily accessible. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I'm down the hall. <laughs> like, I'm just shifting over. All right, all right. <laughs> but the ball gets fouled off. I can see it's going to clear the net. Initially, I think it's going to go right above the window. I'm thinking, oh, we we've, just missed another one. We've had a few of those. Because on Friday, we had one that hit the, like, there's the windowsill about that far and then the facing of the press box, which is like the concrete. Yeah. It hit the concrete. And I was like, oh, I just missed. Sunday, foul ball. I think it's going higher. It's falling fast. I'm like, ooh, it's coming in here. So I stand up, and I completely forget Terry exists. I forget he is on the face of the planet at this point. Because I'm like, this ball is coming in the booth. I'm either catching it or I'm eating it. It's one of the two, and I like the first one a lot better. Mm -hmm. And so I've got I've got my hands ready to catch it. And I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, this is going to be awesome. I think of uh, Haxton yeah. down at Texas Tech. My hand hurts so bad right, right now. He caught it barehanded. I wasn't going to try to do the one-handed, just stick it. No, we weren't going to do that. And so I was going to catch it, and in my head, I'm thinking, I'm about to catch this ball. This is going to be awesome. And about... Five feet from me, all of a sudden, I get taken out and sideswiped. Terry comes in and like knocks me to the side, hits off my hand, and Ricochet's back 
into the back of the booth. I think there's a dent on the back wall now. And then Terry dives on the floor and tries to pick up the ball. The rest of the game, he says how he dove in front of me to save my life and that he caught it barehanded and he he didn't. He didn't do any of that. He got in my way. And there were witnesses that texted me, did Terry just knock you out of the way? Yes. So there are witnesses that this happened. And as Paul Harvey used to say, and now you know the rest of the story. Right. You know the true story. That true story, too. The true story. I believe that. I was so mad. (laughs) But the ball ended up in the booth. Ball's still in the booth. Terry signed it. It didn't touch the window. Like, it was perfectly... You couldn't have thrown it up there any better. So after all those years of waiting for a ball to go in the booth. Right. And it doesn't seem like a ball would be coming in that hot. That thing was moving. (laughs) It's amazing how much speed a ball can pick up in about 30 feet. Because it, it, was, it was coming pretty good. So Terry knocks me out of the way of what could have been one of the coolest things I've ever done. You got a good story out of it, though. Oh, no doubt. And he and I will forever argue on if he got in the way of me or... Man, why don't you let him catch that foul ball? Yeah. Man, why are you talking about him? Come on. Yeah. So if you see Terry... I want everybody just to pester him of why he knocked me out of the way. Everybody. Well, he'll be there tomorrow night, so we'll be able to... Right. Just pester okay. everything out of him. Okay. So, that's the challenge for Eagle Nation. Armed, Pe- armed and dangerous. Yeah. Pester Harvin. That's it. But a busy week for Georgia Southern Baseball. Five games on the docket this week. Two against Georgia. Tomorrow at SRP Park. 6.35 first pitch. 6 o'clock first pitch at J.I. Clements on Wednesday. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday against William & Mary. All at J.I. Clements as well. For the voice of the Eagles, Danny Reed. This is Colin Lacey saying so long, everybody. You've been listening to Inside Eagle Nation. Powered by Learfield the official podcast of Georgia Southern Athletics.